knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. In the previous tutorial, we began to understand what climate is and how it is impacted by variations in Earth's orbit and solar activity. Now let's look at some internal factors that can impact climate. First up, volcanoes. We learned about these in some detail over in the geology series. So what do they have to do with climate? Perhaps surprisingly, in the grand scheme of things, volcanoes have a short-term cooling effect of about 0.1 to 0.2 degrees Celsius as they pump out dust and ash, which can temporarily block out sunlight. Volcanoes also spew out sulfur dioxide gas, which when combined with water vapor and dust in the atmosphere, forms sulfate. Sulfate aerosols actually reflect sunlight away from the Earth's surface, and so their cooling effect outweighs warming caused by greenhouse gases that are also emitted during eruptions. In 1991, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines, it caused a 0.5 degree Celsius drop in global temperature. This cataclysmic eruption was the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Although volcanoes also emit carbon dioxide, a prominent greenhouse gas in our atmosphere, the average emissions are less than 1% of those from current human emissions. Thus, volcanoes cannot be blamed for the current rise in temperatures. To put some numbers on it, the burning of fossil fuels dumps billions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. These emissions are about 100 times greater than even the maximum estimated volcanic carbon dioxide fluxes. Let's now move on to the ocean. Ocean currents are located at the surface as well as in deep water below 300 meters, causing water to move horizontally and vertically on local and global scales. The ocean has its own interconnected current or circulation system powered by the wind, tides, Earth's rotation, the sun, and water density differences. Deep ocean currents are density driven and they differ from surface currents in scale, speed, and energy. Water density in turn is affected by the temperature, salinity, and depth of the water. The colder and saltier the water is, the denser it is. The greater the density differences between different layers in the water column, the greater the mixing and circulation. This global scale circulation system is called the global conveyor belt, which circulates the globe in a 1,000 year cycle. While warm surface currents carry less dense water away from the equator and towards the poles, cold deep ocean currents carry dense water away from the poles and towards the equator. The ocean's global circulation system plays a key role in distributing heat energy, regulating weather and climate, and cycling vital nutrients and gases to organisms that call its waters home. As climate change is causing a lot of glaciers and ice sheets to melt, cold, fresh water is being increasingly pumped into the ocean system. Since this new water is fresh, it is less dense than ocean water. Thus, in crucial places where water should be sinking and driving circulation, like near the poles, fresh water inputs are weakening the circulation instead. This will have global impacts and disrupt sensitive ocean ecosystems. Already, coral reefs are being affected by warmer equatorial water temperatures. They're stressed and bleaching as a result, a phenomenon we discussed over in the zoology series. Where there were once beautiful colored reefs, there are now only skeletal remains. As ocean waters warm, they are also less able to hold gases, such as carbon dioxide and oxygen. This has led certain regions to become oxygen limited or even anoxic, meaning they contain no oxygen. Species of marine life reliant on oxygen will be forced to migrate to waters that can support them with higher oxygen levels. And while the ocean is vast, this represents issues in regards to local carrying capacity of oceanic regions where species may migrate to, and even human conflict when it comes to fishing territories and international governance. We mentioned that warm ocean waters can hold on to less carbon dioxide. This is major considering the fact that the ocean is the world's largest active carbon dioxide storage center. Typically, the cold water of the ocean allows it to take in excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via diffusion. In polar regions where water is coldest, 
densest and taking up the most carbon dioxide, deep water formation allows it to be transported to depths where it can be stored for at least the thousand years that ocean circulation requires. This is a powerful way that the ocean acts to balance the internal climate system and slow the effects of global warming. However, as ocean waters warm and ocean circulation weakens, less carbon dioxide can be removed from the atmosphere and sequestered to the deep ocean. Let's look at some more examples of internal climate variability. Many times these can involve positive feedbacks or processes in which the end products of an action cause more of that action to occur in a feedback loop. One example is the El Niño-La Niña cycle, which can cause temporary warming and cooling. Both phenomena affect oceanic and atmospheric circulation patterns and influence global climate. While El Niño increases global temperature, La Niña decreases it. When El Niño occurs, it impacts the west coast of South America and southwestern portions of North America. El Niño disrupts the cold water upwelling to the surface of the ocean, which typically brings with it nutrients and ample fishing opportunities. Instead, warm water pools at the surface of the ocean, suppressing the upwelling and often disrupting the ecosystem and fishing community. Actually, these effects are felt globally. If you ever hear, it's an El Niño year, during a weather report on your local TV news show, now you know why. It will affect global temperature and precipitation. In a La Niña year, colder than usual water appears off the west coast of South America instead, also affecting global temperature and precipitation patterns. This cycle repeats itself on a time scale of about five years, and while the changes are short-term, they have the ability to hinder human food production and availability internationally. Another example of internal variability is the Arctic Oscillation, or AO, which is associated with changing patterns of air pressure in the Northern Hemisphere. This phenomenon brings warmer weather to parts of Europe and North America, leaving the Arctic colder than usual when it's in its positive phase. The negative phase of the AO brings the opposite conditions, resulting in a warmer than usual Arctic and colder weather in the subpolar regions. Because of this seesaw effect, the AO has little effect on global temperatures, but can significantly influence local and regional weather, still impacting species and habitats on a large scale, including humans. Thus, while internal variability in the form of these various oscillations show close correlation with global temperatures over the short term, they cannot explain the long-term warming trends over the past few decades. Research instead shows that long-term trends in sea surface temperatures are driven predominantly by the planet's energy imbalance, in which more solar radiation is being received by the planet than is being released. This imbalance is due to the excess of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, which trap outgoing heat and which have accumulated due to human activity. With climate now better understood, let's shift gears back to living organisms and their evolution. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.